Hi, kia ora. Thanks very much for having me uh, talk. I like to get straight into things. Um, such an important topic. You can see straight away uh, if you look at this picture on the scan here on the slide. Uh, skin layer up there, bit of soft tissue layer. And that's what bones look like on ultrasound. Uh, one of my points is going to be how easy it is to see bones on an ultrasound and easy to see fractures. So this is a fifth metacarpal. It's the old boxes fracture. You can see how much displacement there is. You can measure that if you want. You can see how much angulation there is. You can measure that if you want. And you can straighten it and put the scan back on and make sure you've done a good job. So with ultrasound, whether you're working in urgent care or working in an emergency department, working in general practice, I think ultrasound is like gravity. It is an inevitable force of nature. It's something that we're all going to have to eventually take the plunge into. Uh, it's a question of when and no better time than now. So one of the things I've been trying to do over recent years is to incorporate ultrasound into as much of my routine medical practice as I can. So you know, when I work in general practice, you know, somebody comes in with their needing their scripts for their blood pressure pills, have a listen to the heart, actually just put the scan on, have a look, do a quick parasternal long axis view. You know, you've got your ultrasound machine sitting there on the desk, turned on, gelled up, ready to go. Just have a look. It takes uh, the same amount of time as it takes to listen to the heart, just to have a look at the heart. Uh, someone comes in with a tummy pain in general practice, you know, have a look at the tummy. Amazing how often it can be helpful. And now, of course, I'm kind of talking about musculoskeletal ultrasound. And having scanned, you know, thousands of broken bones and injuries over the last year in fracture clinic, I um, find myself surprised that musculoskeletal ultrasound isn't actually the first thing that we get taught about ultrasound. The first skill that we learn, perhaps that should be musculoskeletal ultrasound. Here's a clavicle. Look how easy it is to see. It's right close to the skin. It's a long bone. It's absolute uh, classic um, fodder for uh, a musculoskeletal ultrasonographer. Easy to get a picture of, easy to see the fracture, and get on and manage it. I do a bit of uh, ship doctoring in, in subantarctic regions and that, and uh, sometimes it's pretty rough. There's an x-ray machine on board, it weighs about 200 kilos in a big heavy sea. Uh, somebody falls over, injures themselves, you want to try and move that x-ray machine into position to take a picture. Very dangerous. So I found just pulling out the ultrasound machine, getting a quick look. Uh, ultrasound is very good for ruling out fractures, especially fractures of long bones. So often an ultrasound will take away the need for doing an x-ray, either because you see an, a fracture that you can manage uh, confidently without an x-ray, or because you can see there's actually no fracture and be confident about that. So let's go through some injuries. Here's the classic. Child comes in after a fall, you see a bit of swelling, uh, tenderness around the wrist. Um, you wonder if you should do an x-ray. Instead of doing x-ray, do a scan and you'll get the hang of doing these after a while. I mean, there, uh, it's useful to scan a few and see. Normally this is a sort of a smooth line through to the growth plate here. There's the growth plate. This is the end of the radius going down into the joint. Growth plate. And here's the buckle. This is quite a big buckle. You get big buckles, small buckles. And buckles are one of the fractures that have been shown in, in, kind of in research to be safely managed with a scan. Uh, I no longer x-ray these if I uh, am confident with what I've seen on the scan. So another buckle. Here's the scan on the left. The skin at the top, muscle layer there, soft tissue muscle. There's the bone growth plate, so at the sort of the end of the radius. See that elevation there? That's a buckle. Um, you can compare to the other side. You know, it's one thing with the ultrasound, you can always compare the opposite limb. And just have a look. So you can see that there's a, um, yeah, there's a, a little buckle there. 
and growth plate. And then you you do an X-ray, and there's the buckle there. It's actually harder to see on the X-ray. It's quite subtle that little buckle there. Often you get that situation where the scan is actually easier to see than the X-ray. I've seen that over and over now. And sometimes uh, the scan will show a fracture that uh, the X-ray doesn't show. So scan all your buckle fractures. Scan your clavicles. Scan your neck of fifth metacarpals. Those are the ones we covered so far. Here's a mid-shaft metacarpal. Look at this. Look how simple this is to see. Let's look at your skin, your sort of skin layer. There's your soft tissue. You can see it's a bit swollen in there. There's the bone. And you can measure the angle. Just put a protractor on there or some fancy... Uh, ultrasound measurement there. See what the angle is. Does it need to be adjusted? Well, maybe, maybe not. In this case, yes. Um, do your adjustment and then rescan. That's the same bone. And then you can see that you've got the adjustment correct. And this is, brings me to the two reasons why I do musculoskeletal, or the two situations of musculoskeletal scanning. One is in the acute phase, one's in the follow-up. So the acute phase is obviously this situation here where you find your uh, you find your fracture, you do your satisfying ulnar nerve block in the mid forearm, and you adjust it, you check on the scan, and then you put it in plaster. Usually when I put it in plaster, then I will scan it, I will x-ray it and just make sure that the position has held because you obviously can't scan through a plaster. But all the other things you can just do with a scan saves you time, super satisfying. The second type of ultrasound situation in musculoskeletal is your follow-ups. So you've already got a diagnosis. But you might see people back after a week. For example, this uh, person has come back after a week with a base of uh, fifth metatarsal fracture. I like to re-image those a week later, make sure that they're not being displaced. And you can see on the ultrasound, a lovely view there of a perfect position and the x-ray that we did this is the same patient the x-ray that we did um, is in the end redundant because we get all that information off a scan we can already see that it's in a good position so this is an example of where I would be able to avoid x-rays which is uh, good for many reasons um, and um, also but just with confidence be able to show the person and people love this people loved you being able to show them as you're doing the picture, exactly what's going on. And this is one of the joys of musculoskeletal ultrasound. You can show people straight away what's going on and people get really engaged with that. In fact, people often, uh, when you put the scan on, they'll say, oh, look, there's the fracture. And to me, that is, and they're usually right. And to me, that's a sign of how uh, straightforward it is to learn basic musculoskeletal ultrasounding for especially long bone fractures and there's research about that about how easy it is to train people undergraduates uh, postgraduates even us crusty old postgraduates we can learn this stuff uh, very quickly and uh, start applying it in our practice so here's the same fracture uh, that fifth metatarsal so easy to see and Lots of research about this, as I was saying. There's just endless, if you just do a uh, search, there's just sort of endless studies now showing um, good correlation between ultrasound and X-ray findings. And not too surprisingly to me now, often showing more accuracy, specificity, sensitivity of ultrasound over X-rays, particularly in long bones. The closer you get to a joint, um, the more tricky it is and short bones are often said to be reasonably uh, tricky as well although in my experience it's often easy to find a short bone uh, avulsion like a cuboid avulsion or a talus avulsion easy to find one of those compared to looking on uh, on an x-ray so here's a typical emergency department uh, urgent care uh, sorry little girl she's fallen over She's got sore wrists and she's come straight into our clinic. We just took her straight in and she doesn't have an x-ray. We thought we would um, have a quick look at the scan. And, and uh, 
part of that is trying to get the trust of the child and, and the mum. And one thing I would say is that kids really get into this. They really like the fact that they can take control of things. And you just get the probe and you can give the probe to the child, if you like, and ask them to put the probe on where it hurts. And they'll take the probe and they'll just put, and put tons of gel. Okay, tons of gel. So you, we use what was called the standoff method, where you don't even touch the skin with the probe. And they just touch the probe onto the gel, get a beautiful picture through that clear gel, and uh, without even hurt, without hurting the child. And you can show straight away to the child, to the mother, where the fracture is, and you can see there's a that's a little buckle there. A decent sort of a buckle really and so very clear straight away um, knows the parents know what's going on the child's kind of on board with things and you get on to your treatment in this situation we did do an x-ray actually it's a sneaky x-ray this one this is a follow-up x-ray that we did three weeks later because it was it was more than just a simple buckle you can see it there's a little breach of the cortex and here is new callus so just another great little trick that you can do with ultrasound. You can see healing, bone healing on an ultrasound. This uh, slide is just to show that short bones are not immune to ultrasounds. They're very useful. Just patient will point out where it's sore. You go straight there, right where it's sore. And you'll see these little avulsions that you can't even find on x-rays. Bit of a dilemma because then you've got to decide what to do with them. I mean, uh, no one believes they're there because it's not on an x-ray. But this, this happens quite a bit. Um, cuboids, taluses, little bits off the top of scaphoids. You can see these things and uh, get on and get on and treat them. Here's a short segment on... Um, in this segment, I just wanted to show you how I sort of set up for scanning and um, just some ideas for how you can get going. When I'm uh, running a clinic or an emergency or an urgent care or in general practice, I have my scan machine uh, switched on uh, right at the desk or at the bedside or right, right where the patient's going to be, ready to go. Uh, I've got my gel ready and I'm um, pretty much anticipating scanning people uh, when they come in and I'm uh, often we'll have people come in and as they sit down and they start describing, you know, maybe they're describing an injury to their arm, then I'll, I'll have their arm there like that and I'll just, I'll just, um, I might just start scanning straight away as we talk. I don't mind uh, scanning before I examine people. People will say, look, it's sore there. You're taking your history, you're doing everything at once. We're used to doing everything at once. We're used to doing all the A, B, C, D, E's all at the same time, you know. We are, um, and we're, we're kind of raising the profile of ultrasound by just sort of elevating it into the examination quickly. Of course, you need to be thorough, your thorough history, your thorough exam. Um, but let's, let's remember that uh, ultrasound is one of the most important things that we do. And here's me, just um, try this yourself. Just do a lot of scanning on your own anatomy. Use your own musculoskeletal anatomy. You've got two sides as well, you can compare. Here I'm just putting the scan longitudinally on my forearm and just getting a sense of, okay, that's the bone. Remember you want your depth to be as shallow as possible so you don't have dead space down the bottom. So there we go, just looking at the it's looking at the longitudinal view of the bone and you can look from th you know with the radius you've got three longitudinal views you've got a longitudinal view from the volar aspect there it is there from the radial aspect there it is there and you can go up and down towards the wrist towards the elbow make sure you're orientated you know which which way is which on your scan and then, you know, from the dorsal surface as well. And you can go down towards the wrist. Okay, just get used to doing that. And of course you can go transverse if you want to. There's your transverse view. So I like to have my scan ready. I might have a machine like this. I use my butterfly a lot, just to travel with that and do remote work with that all the time. 
it's perfectly adequate for these sort of simple musculoskeletal skeletal examinations that I've been talking about. One of my favorites is the, um, is the elbow. Uh, is there a fracture? That's your question. So the best way to determine that is to see if there's fluid in the elbow. That will, uh, if there's a supracondylar fracture, radial head, radial neck, so intra-articular fracture like that, then you'll see an effusion. And the best way to see an effusion, it's very simple, it's looking at the posterior fat pad, which is what we do on an x-ray, isn't it? We look at the lateral, we look at the elevation of the posterior fat pad, much easier to see on a scan. Um, you have the elbow at 90 degrees, I'm just showing you with my elbow. You put the scan on longitudinally, and make sure you've adjusted your depth longitudinally and then there's your from left to right you can see the triceps tendon kind of coming down um, coming down and, and wrapping around the olecranon at the end there and that deep valley in the bone there that's the olecranon fossa and that's filled with fat pad you see the fat pad in there and there's no sort of bulging or pushing out of the fat pad, just sitting nice and flat in the olecranon fossa. We'll talk a bit, a bit more about that as we go. So here are some elbow examples. Look, um, longitudinal view of the back of the elbow. That's the triceps there, the skin up there, triceps muscle curling around and will join onto the olecranon back there. Here's the olecranon fossa, and that's the fat pad that's supposed to be sitting down here, right? That's the fat pad that's, and that's become a bit elevated because of this. This hypo echogenic area is effusion, okay? So that's what an effusion looks like. That's a small one. Here's another view. Um, that's the skin up there, subcutaneous tissue fat. There's the triceps, beautiful curling around triceps. It's going to insert on the um, olecranon on there somewhere. And here's the big, bigger fusion here in the olecranon fossa. This one here, this is uh, the triceps here. So the olecranon will be back, back there somewhere. And you can see this big space here full of fluid so that's an effusion pushing the fat pad up there here's another one this is probably the the best view these still images are never ideal but um, here's the triceps there that's going to insert onto the olecranon and um, there's the fat pad that's been elevated out of the olecranon fossa that's sitting right there so all of these effusions mean that there is more than likely more than 80 percent chance uh, a fracture. So that tells me if I see an effusion like that, that tells me to x-ray that elbow. If I don't see an effusion and I'm not that suspicious, then I don't x-ray. And it's nice to show that to the patient. The patient understands. They've had their imaging. They don't need their x-ray. They're satisfied enough with your brilliant uh, ultrasound x-ray. Ultrasound, so you can just get on with uh, your explanation from there. And just as an example, here's a, another effusion. This is the lower tibia as it dives down into the ankle joint. There's the talus. Of course, there's an articulation with the tibia and the talus. And this area here is effusion. And the dark area is the sort of clear effusion. And this is actually a blood clot here, uh, which you sometimes see in the elbow as well, where it doesn't look like just a pure black space because blood clot looks that kind of... Uh, consistency. So this tells me that there's likely to be a fracture around the ankle somewhere and that's useful. Sometimes you don't see that on an x-ray. Sometimes you won't see uh, the um, ankle fracture. There might be an osteochondral issue on the talus, the dome of the talus. Um, and so this is a useful clue. This one is quite uh, obvious one. It's um, you little play a little video there, I think. Yeah, so you can see it's a slightly different angle. You can certainly see around this area. Um, all this is um, 
effusion, probably a blood clot there, pushing up the fat pad out of the olecranon fossa. Easy to see. And incidentally, you can usually see the fracture, if you've got a decent enough ultrasound machine, you usually see the fracture uh, in the radial head or radial neck, uh, or if it is, uh, sometimes elsewhere in the elbow as well. Here we go, not a particularly good image, but yes, the skin, subcutaneous tissue, muscle layer, here's uh, the radial, the proximal radius, radial neck, coming up to the radial head there, and you can see a little irregularity there, which is clearer on dynamic scanning. Um, it's a little fracture in there, and you can, uh, you can often see those. Finger, fingers and toes, very amenable to scanning. Uh, close to the skin and consider them long bones, you can often rule out a fracture. So if you see really nice smooth uh, longitudinal lines on the bone of the bones and the joints and you know no breach in the cortex and uh, joints are intact as you can see there's no fracture, no dislocation, no x-ray. Uh, mallets, pretty easy to see. I often like to do these in a water bath. You know you put the, put the uh, hand in some warm water and you just bring the scan close to it and it, it's sort of a standoff. It's like using thick gel. Uh, often get a lovely detailed picture. Anyway, so you, as you can see, you can see these um, mallet, this mallet on x-ray. You see these on a scan as well. Actually, on a scan, uh, I haven't m really missed a, an avulsion of a mallet. So I don't x-ray x -ray these anymore. Um, this is a kind of an old handheld machine I took this on. You can see the um, middle phalanx there, sort of the end, the distal end of the middle phalanx. You see a little avulsion come off the distal phalanx. Uh, this is the joint in here, a little avulsion there. So you can see those. Um, and if, and uh, it's nice to know that if there's a bony mallet or a non-bony mallet, kind of affects the treatment to some, to some extent. Here's an example of a second metatarsal fracture. Is the MTP joint. There's the bone there. You can see it actually runs down here, but you, you'll see when I play the video. And notice you see the skin, the subcutaneous layer. You can't see into bones on an uh, ultrasound, so this is all just reflection under here. So we'd pretty much ignore all that. We're just interested in this and this. And it. when you're doing the scan, it's a longitudinal scan, when you're doing a scan, just very gently rock across the scan area side to side get a uh, much like you do your um, you do that with any other kind of uh, ultrasound and here's the appearance that you get you just you know, see that you can just sort of clarify that whole area like that i think that uh, every achilles deserves a point of care ultrasound that's the conclusion i've come to i've seen achilles missed i've seen uh, several missed Achilles tendon ruptures and I've seen a number of Achilles uh, diagnosed as ruptures when they're not ruptures. Simple to look at on a scan. Uh, remember a tendon looks like someone's taken a paintbrush and just swept it across the screen in a single flow. That's what a normal Achilles might look like, a little bit like that. And there's the calcaneus. Always start at the calcaneus in the longitudinal view and just sort of scroll along. Normally the uh, width of the Achilles just gradually gets less and less and less as it goes up. This one's slightly bulging, uh, there might be slightly abnormal, but that's the general idea. This one, you can see the, uh, the calcaneus here. You can see the Achilles just, it looks like someone's taken a paintbrush and gone across, but it's very bulging, isn't it? It's not supposed to do that. It's supposed to be a sort of a similar sort of a diameter all along there and they get narrower and narrower like it does there. That's not right. So that's a uh, Achilles tendinosis, a swollen Achilles, but it's not ruptured. There's incidentally a little uh, fluid in the bursa there, the retrocalcaneal bursa. So here's another one. This is uh, the paintbrush appearance and stops. Very easy to see. You'll see this. Uh, the first, and the patient will point it out to you if you've got it on the screen in front of them. If you can get the screen in front of a lying down patient, they will say, "Oh my God!" They love seeing this. I mean, I know it's a clinical diagnosis. We do the Thompson test. We feel for the divot, 
um, we take the history, it's you know classic. But showing this to the patient really helps them embark on their nine month rehab. Um, I just think it's a, there's, there's so many reasons that we should be scanning these. Here's another one, uh, pretty obviously disrupted and massively swollen, look, three centimeters. And Achilles in the AP diameter should be less than six millimeters. So gives you an idea. Here's another one. There's the calcaneus there. You can see it's intact, but it's a very bulging, ugly looking, unhappy tendinosis type tendon there. Might be sore, might not. And that's um, you know, bigger than six millimeters. You've got the measurement there. Here's another one. Look, uh, starts off from the calcaneus okay, and then it's bulging out pretty dramatically. It's not ruptured though, it's just a uh, yep, big swollen Achilles. Yeah, you get very used to looking at these after a while, and uh, you know, your nice paintbrush appearance there, but you'll see what happens as you go along. It becomes very, very ugly. It's completely disrupted there, with, filled with clot and complete rupture. So have a look at these. Look at these um, every chance you get. Compare the other side, you'll always see a really nice comparison on the other side. So you get the patient lying down with the feet hanging over the end of the bed. And just, um, yeah, just move the scanner from one side to the other in a longitudinal plane. You can also do these transverse, very, um, very helpful for me certain measurements, but um, the longitudinal gives it away. And uh, people, and just yeah, record it on the screen, show your patient, they'll really appreciate that. Here's a slide that's got a bit out of control. Apologies for that. I decided to call this slide the hedgehog of opportunity, or maybe the hedgehog of desire. It's this prickly thing. Just covering some of the low-hanging fruit that we talked about in terms of things that you can easily start to incorporate into your musculoskeletal ultrasound practice wherever you are, whether you're GP, whether you're an emergency department worker, urgent care whether you're in the bush in the middle of nowhere, or whether you're in downtown somewhere. These are the things that you can easily access with your point of care ultrasound. Of course, there are some things that are a little more sort of higher hanging fruit. I haven't really finished the low hanging fruit yet, but high hanging fruit. I mean, scaphoids, I've uh, started doing a lot of scaphoid scannings. Um, there are some studies showing clinical scaphoids are better assessed with an ultrasound and you can clear uh, clinical, you can clear scaphoids, get people um, back to work quicker, back into things without the sort of two week then re-x-ray type thing. There's a low hanging fruit. What about skull x-rays? You know, your child that comes in, great big egg on the head, uh, mother absolutely beside herself, pop the scan on, you can show the mum, look, uh, there's nothing wrong with the skull. Uh, maybe reassure yourself too if it's a really dramatic sort of presentation. These uh, these bones are easy to see. Um, I like doing gastroc tears. I like looking at uh, muscle tears. You can grade them, send them off to the physio with a grade two gastroc tear. Um, you give the patient a bit more certainty about how long it's going to take to get better. Get the physio a bit more clarity. Physios love that. Physios love it when you see an ankle sprain and you look at the lateral ankle ligaments you know you've got your atfl there uh, your anterior talofibular ligament you've got your calo calcaneo fibula ligament you can say well, look the atfl is gone but the uh, cfl is still you know still intact gives the physio more to work with and it kind of brings a bit of precision to our diagnoses which i think we we do neglect you know i like to scan every ucl that comes in the department i've seen a number of third degree you know complete ruptures of ucls missed it's a very difficult examination in the context of um, a very sore thumb and a, you know an acute injury and these often just get stuck into a cast treated as a, in a thumb spiker uh, as a grade two and then end up going for surgery way down the track all that lost time so look these are just uh, these are just ideas i mean there's, there's so many um lumps and bumps you know is it an abscess can we aspirate it how deep is it why don't we watch 
why don't we aspirate with a needle and watch um, how empty we can make it and get them back the next day, re-aspirate. Is it a lymphoma, sorry, a, or a lipoma? Is it a cyst? You know, these sort of lumps, tricky things on the skin, often easy. Is it a lymph node? These all have sort of classic, you know, appearances. So, you know, just an idea. Um, there's so much out there. Start, pick something and start e easy and get yourself on the, on the road to scanning. We'll go through a few more quick things um, before we wrap up. Some of the most fun musculoskeletal ultrasound is in the domain of ligaments. You remember that uh, you, know, you get the patient coming in with a bad ankle, very swollen, you take an x-ray, you're surprised there's no, there's no fracture, but the person can't walk. Very swollen, tender in the anterior ankle as well. Put the scan on and you look between the lower fibula and tibia so the anterior inferior tibiofibular ligament. This is a lovely ligament to look at. Um, this is a still image so you get a bit of anisotropy here and there but remember anisotropy is a big issue in tendons and ligaments. It's where you don't quite have a 90 degree angle of the ultrasound beam and so you get these darker areas and you can correct for it dynamically as you're doing the scan just by changing the angle of the scan. Um, anyway, here's the tib fib, or the tib fib if you like, the other way around, and there's the AITFL, the anterior inferior tibia fibula ligament, and it looks beautiful really as you go along there. There's, a, there's another patient here, also a high, a high ankle sprain. Somebody's got a high ankle sprain, they're super sore, there's no fracture, they're very swollen. You really want to make sure this ligament is intact. So these look small ligamenty things, you need a bit of resolution. Our handheld scanners sometimes don't give that, and they will in the future. Next few years, I think we'll be able to look at all of these things. And um, I spend a lot of time looking at these ligaments and also all the other favorite ligaments there are. There's a zillion ligaments around the body that are useful to look at. The UCL, you know, in the thumb, classic. The scapholunate ligament, the Liz Frank, easy to see uh, when you know when you have a, a decent enough machine. You've got your MCL, your LCLs around the knees. You've got all these uh, ligaments that are kind of opening up to us as options. Not to mention you know, everything around the shoulder, uh, you know, other, other ligaments around the knee. Remember the old pen, pes anserinus? That's all opened up to you when you've got a decent scanner. Lots of things. Plantar fascia, plantar fasciitis, the insertion of the plantar ligament, very easy to see and measure, give your patient some certainty in uh, diagnosis. So watch out. I think it's watch this space for ligaments. We're all good to, we're all on the verge of getting going with these. And man, are we going to spruce up our anatomy to do that? Yeah, before you know it, uh, somebody's barely had time to change your shirt and someone's asked you to look for a foreign body. They've been digging around, haven't been able to find anything. Sometimes these things can be really troublesome and you can see it's shining up like a light bulb on your scan. It's a tiny thing, 1.4 millimeters, you know, less than 1.4 millimeters and there it is under the skin. I don't usually take these out under scan guidance as such. I just check, is there a foreign body there? Yes. Kind of mark out where it is, put a kind of cross at each end of the scan and across the center, right underneath it, get it right in the middle, um, and then measure how far under the skin it is, measure the size of it, have a look at which way it's orientated, and then just go in and get it out in the normal way. So surprising how tricky these things can be, you know, they're so obvious. Uh, when you look under a scan and, and yet you can be digging around and not be able to find them and uh, I really like to be able to just have a have a look you know, a bit of a squish around get a sense of where it is mark it out and then just go straight to it here's one more yep and once again quite easy to see measure how big it is measure look where exactly where it is it's a nice easy one under the skin sometimes they way down here and sometimes they can be hard to find, even if you know they're there. And one thing you can do is you can pop a needle in under vision 
and go right to it and touch it. And you can pop another one in from a different angle if you want and touch it and where they meet and then leave the needles in and then take the scan away and just go down onto the points of the needles. Quite nice way of doing it. But uh, yeah, quite often you'll be able to just dig these out really easily. Save you time. Incidentally, these are presentations that I think should virtually never get to an emergency department. These are things we can take out in urgent care, and uh, I normally just take these out in general practice. And that goes for a lot of the things that we've covered in this talk. You know, some things that we can divert from, you know, filling up our bigger centres. Rib injuries are an absolute joy to scan. Your patient comes with an expectation of imaging, that they? they want an x-ray, they want something done. And you tell them, trying to explain to them the x-ray doesn't affect the outcome, and they're going to do an x-ray, it's radiation, all true. Uh, however, uh, ultrasound's a game changer. You get the patient to point out where on the skin it's painful, or give them the probe and tell them to put the probe right where it hurts. None of this sort of looking around vaguely through x-rays to see you know, where the patient might be sore and whether it might be a fracture or not. Just go straight onto the point of tenderness and usually you end up with something like this where you see a clear breach in the cortex. These things usually stand out really easily, even little subtle ones like that you wouldn't see on an x-ray. You've got all this information. At the same time, of course, you know, you're doing your lung pocus. You want to make sure there's no pneumothorax. You're aware that a uh, scan is much more accurate than a chest X-ray in looking for um, for pneumothorax. Uh, you want to do your M mode as well and do your, your B mode, looking for you know crawling ants and you know looking that's that's the pleural line there. Here there's a little effusion. This is the intercostal muscle, you know rib shadow there. It's a little bit sideways. This this one. These are all very fun to do, very useful. This is an older rib fracture. This is all big callus, big lump of callus. There's the baseline of the rib there. Remember, you can't see into bones, right? It's just shadows under the under bones. You see the top skin layer, muscle layer, bones, and then big shadow. So just remember, this is where your your ultrasound becomes an integral part of your examination. The patient's pointing where it's sore, you're feeling around, you're finding the spot, you're putting the scan on there at the same time. You see these little things, you never see that on an x-ray. Patients love to see this, they love to know what's going on, they deserve a diagnosis. And you might have wondered what a, a rib cartilage looks like. The ribs just go along and then they suddenly stop. It got me for a while until uh, I realised this is this is rib cartilage. Cartilage is um, relatively black on the scan. It's hypoechogenic. It's a quite fluid-filled structure. And, you know, you normally I'm seeing these longitudinally. So you've got a bit of practice to get the probe longitudinal along the, um, along the line of the ribs. And you do learn which way, how ribs go after a while. You learn to follow them right from the very back towards the spine, right around to the front and to the costochondral junction there. Often people are sore in the costochondral junction. You say, oh, look, uh, you don't have a fracture, but you've got a, a rib cartilage injury. Uh, sometimes you see a little popped rib where there's a little disruption here. So all very fun and all very useful. So here's a quick typical rib fracture consultation where you're just doing the examination at the same time as you're just doing your uh, quick scan. This is literally how long it takes. So we just pop the. So we just pop the. That's the way. We just pop that on there. That's the way. We just pop that on there. Oh, there we go. So, it's, and, and we're on, go. right so on the fracture. And we're on the, right on the fracture. So interesting that that's literally as quick as it is, and super satisfying for everyone concerned. So you get your patient coming in with a knee injury, see one of the two of these every day, and big swollen knee, virtually impossible to examine. And um, all you end up doing is deciding whether to x-ray or not and putting it in some sort of support. Scanning can be uh, super useful in this situation. For one thing, you can easily find an effusion. Sometimes a great big knee, big person can be hard to, hard to detect an effusion. 
Um, this is an example, I think, where uh, ultrasound can replace your examination to some extent. There's so many poor examination techniques. I think the shoulder is a classic example. Much better just put a scan on than try all the myriad of different poorly sensitive and specific shoulder examination techniques. The knee's a bit the same. Anyway, um, you can see an effusion. This is a decent sized one. You can see small ones as well. You also can use this to guide your needle. Uh, if you're going to say you've got a big tense knee, um, of course it's easy to aspirate these without um, uh, ultrasound guidance they're so, if they're so big. Um, but the days of us sort of old sharks, you know, injecting and aspirating everything under um, under feel and um, anatomy techniques pretty much over and it's useful I find it even though I'm happy to aspirate these normally I would just like to do it under scan because you put the needle in you can see under scan you can see um, as you suck out the blood or whatever's in there you can see exactly how much you've got to go instead of having to wriggle it around and try and find the pocket again as it gets less and less and you push from the other side and milk a bit more fluid through, you can see it swelling, you can see exactly where to leave your needle and you get the best benefit for the patient. So once you start doing a lot of these, it uh, doesn't really take you any longer than the other method and in some ways it's a lot faster because you're not mucking around trying to find the space. So there's that. Now you've got uh, also these um, uh, another, another view of an effusion, you've got the synovium this is supposed to be a video and I actually may not play. No, sorry, I can't play that. Uh, this is a transverse view. And again, we're probably not going to get the video to play. This is an example of a, uh, you can see I've put a, you know, a higher frequency on here because I'm very surface looking right on the medial joint line. That's the femur, tibia. Uh, sorry, femur, tibia, and here you've got this bulging structure coming out of the joint. You can't see into the joint, just like you can't see into bones, all reflection down here. But you know that the medial meniscus normally comes out to about here. The big bulging thing, that tells you there's a damaged medial meniscus. There's probably going to be an effusion as well, which um, there might be other, other injuries as well. And you can see these medial collateral ligament type structures and um, as our technology gets better and uh, we practice more, we can actually see these acute injuries. You can actually assess them for medial meniscal injuries, assess them for um, these uh, collateral ligament injuries, a myriad of other things. The patella is very easy to see on an ultrasound. Um, it's very close to the skin. You can see patella fractures very easily. The patella ligament is like the Achilles, it's beautiful to examine. Lots of these things you can just see, rule out certain things, rule in other things, get people quickly you know, to their appropriate disposition and give the physios, if it's going the physio way, some sort of information. And here's another video that won't play. Anyway, you get the idea. Okay, so you really wanted to see the video. Here it is. This is an effusion, you can, as you can see there. And what you do when you dynamically look at these, I just had look at these effusions just in the around the superior border of the patella, just off to the left or the right in the longitudinal view, just off to the side, medially or laterally, doesn't really matter. And again, there you go. So, and you can squish it together. Just put a bit of pressure with the probe, and you can see the uh, effusion kind of, um, you know, and, and you know gives you a good idea of the, you know, the size of it and the extent of it as well. You can map, you know, how far the pouch extends if you want, and also once again, you know, great access with your with your needles if you're needly inclined. Hi, look, this quick segment uh, is just to show you quickly how you can incorporate ultrasound in your practice quickly. Now, that right now I happen to be working in a general practice and tomorrow I'll be working in urgent care in the weekend I'll be in an emergency department. The important thing is wherever you are, you know, you've got your, um, you've got your scanner 
I always have my ultrasound scan right next to my computer, right next to my screen. I've got my plugged in ultrasound scan turned on um, with my laptop here. You might use it with your phone, it doesn't matter. Just have it all ready. You've got your gel, everything sitting on the desk, patients here, and your musculoskeletal patient that comes in. I will often examine them, even uh, as we're doing the history and starting the examination, I often do an ultrasound at the same time. You put their uh, you put their limb on the on the desk, or if it's a knee, say for example it's a knee, you don't need to get them on the bed, you just sort of sit them. Sometimes I put their foot up on my uh, desk and um, straight away you can ultrasound their knee. Just just start doing that straight away. It saves you the time. I'm more, more trying to think of a reason not to ultrasound than I'm thinking of a reason to ultrasound in musculoskeletal medicine. Two main reasons why we want to ultrasound these people. One is to help them. Of course, we just want to give them better care, uh, lead to something better. Two, we might need the practice. Um, we all need to do lots and lots of scans to get really familiar with all the areas we're scanning. Scan every normal uh, limb that you can find. Scan the sore one, scan the one that's not sore. A lot of musculoskeletal things you won't see much, you know, it's a bit of a bruise, you'll see some swollen skin, you'll see a bit of cobblestoning or maybe not. You'll just uh, get used to looking at these tissues, asking yourself about these tissues and just have some questions in your mind about the kinds of structures that you want to be able to visualize, build up your expertise. Okay, lots of scanning. The other thing is people ask, well, you know, that's going to take time. Well, it doesn't take much time to do the scanning. What takes people time is thinking that they need to record their scans. And I don't think you need to record your scans. I record the exciting ones. I might save them. I might even put them in the computer system. I might take a photo of it and just have it in a file somewhere in case I need to refer to it. But normally I don't. Normally for a normal scan or something that just shows what I expect, uh, you don't have to record anything. Just like when you listen to a patient's heart, you don't take an audio recording of their heartbeat. You just write what the heart sounds like. Okay? Exactly the same thing. And the other point about that is, if you want to, all you need to do is re record the scan findings, and you need to do that quickly. And some emergency departments don't have this. A lot of urgent care centres and general practices always have this shortcut capacity so that I can write, for example, much of my notes I'm just writing in shortcut. You don't want to waste time that you should be with your patient typing in stuff onto your computer. For example, if I see someone that needs a flu vaccination, I just, uh, and I'm uh, planning to give them a flu vaccination, I will just have a shortcut on my keyboard and will just spit out the entire kind of um, paragraph of things that I need to have checked off. And I, you might know what I'm talking about. If you don't, this is important. I'll just quickly show you. So there's my screen there. Might be able to edit that just to get that right. So that when I'm doing a, say, a flu vaccination, and you know, I check the person, I ask for the check for the contraindications, check all the things, and then I just write a little shortcut, and then I get the whole thing sort of written out within seconds. What if I was doing a knee ultrasound? Um, say I wanted to aspirate a hemarthrosis, a retense hemarthrosis from a decent knee injury. Then I would just have a, a little shortcut like that, and it just immediate, automatically just puts the whole information out there. And there might be some things I'll go in and tweak a couple of things about it. But that's normally everything that I need to write. And so ultrasound, just like uh, other aspects of your uh, medical care, doesn't need to take time in terms of recording it. You just need a few keystrokes and write some extra details in. Same as if you're examining the abdomen. Same as if you're taking a history for a, in a standardized thing, like a six-week check or something. You just have this uh, stereotyped shortcut that you put in. Just a little tip, and that's what I, I would strongly recommend that. So get your machine turned on, get yourself set up, and start scanning.